Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we're covering uh, everything audits, uh, looking at how you can prepare for on-farm audits and how to stay compliant. So thank you very much for, for tuning in and listening today. Um, it's really exciting to, to welcome um, Kathleen Allen from Integrity Systems, who we're going to be hearing from shortly. Um, she's going to deliver some really great insights for us as well. My name is David O'Brien uh, and I'm Head of Farm Success here at AgriWeb uh, and I'll be your host for today. Um, so what I'm going to do is just share my screen and we're going to run through uh, a, a bit of an agenda so we can uh, just get an understanding of, of what's to come. Uh, so we'll go through a little bit of housekeeping, make sure everyone's familiar with how to use the different functions of the, the Q&A and things. Uh, and then we'll jump in and hear from, from Kathleen. Uh, she's the expert um, in auditing, in integrity systems, and uh, all things under that umbrella. So uh, it's going to be really great to hear from Kathleen. And then after Kathleen's segment, um, I'm going to run through a bit of an overview of how you can best use AgriWeb to support you through um, an on-farm audit uh, and get through that nice and quickly and efficiently. Uh, and then after that, we'll also run through a Q&A as well, so you can get all your answers uh, covered off there. Joining with us today, we also have Joanna from Integrity Systems supporting um, the, the Q&A chat. She's going to help moderate that from, from that perspective. Um, and we've also got Edward in there as well to, to handle some questions around AgriWeb as well while we, while we go through the session. So uh, with that all, all covered off, um, what we'll do is just go through a bit of housekeeping there. So um, the key to, to making this um, beneficial for everyone listening in is to, to keep it interactive. So um, please utilize the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your, um, of your video screen. Uh, post through all your questions. And as I said, we've got the team there ready to moderate, um, answer those. And then at the end, we'll, we'll go through um, some of the questions as well and answer those lives. Um, we've also got the, the chat function there as well. So please, um, it's, it'll be great to hear from everyone listening in, who you are, where you're from. Um, hopefully you can tell us if you're getting some of this rain that's coming through. Um, so that'd be really great to hear that. And then we've also got a, a bit of a poll uh, that we wanted to ask as well um, around uh, the auditing. We've actually had a lot of customers recently uh, letting us know that they're, they're, um, they've been getting notices that they're going to have an upcoming audit. Um, so we thought it might be a good idea to, to launch a poll, uh, which I'll do now, uh, and you should see that pop up in the video screen, um, to tell us, you know, how many people have, uh, have either been through an audit recently uh, in the last few months or have one coming up. So that'll be quite interesting to see that spread um, and I can see the yeses are creeping up quite quickly. Um, so yeah, please, please post through your questions. Um, keep it, keep uh, it interactive and make sure you let us know who's joining in on the chat there. Um, we'll give it a few moments uh, to, to get these results of the, the Q&A. Uh, and so far, we're seeing there around 80% um, of people listening are saying, no, they, they haven't had an audit or they haven't got one coming up. Um, so that's quite interesting. 19% um, are saying that, yes, they do have one coming up. So regardless of, of those results there, um, I think it's, it's certainly important to think about how you can prepare um, for an audit and just generally stay compliant um, in terms of your record keeping and what's happening across the farm. Uh, so I might hand it over to, to Kathleen now um, to, to share with us some of her insights. Um, there's quite a lot to, to cover from Kathleen. So uh, Kathleen, if you um, are able to, to jump in there um, and pop your video on as well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much and um, welcome everybody. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, thanks to the AgriWeb team. Just double checking, can you see my screen there? Yes, we can Perfect. see. Perfect. All right, that's great. Um, so just to go along with the question that we've been asked there, so where are you from? Uh, I'm from Yass in southern New South Wales and 
Pleased to report in that it's currently sitting at about a apparent temperature of about minus four. It's absolutely freezing. It's it's wet and it's sort of coming in horizontal ice. But um, compared to this time last year, it's a um, fantastic um, uh, place to be in. So it certainly set us up for a great spring. But um, anyway, so thanks again for the opportunity from AgriWeb. And yes, we do have quite a bit of um, information to to get through. And I do hope that the um, internet stays with me this afternoon. So. Um, I guess, where will we start? Um, I thought that I'd probably just go for uh, go through with you the role of the integrity systems company, uh, the importance of the red meat integrity system uh, to all of us as a livestock uh, sector, uh, the integrity system programs, particularly livestock production assurance and the national livestock identification system. Then touching in particular of relevance today is around uh, the accreditation and audits and being uh, making sure that you are compliant with your LPA um, requirements. And then um, a couple of handy tips and tools and in particular um, helping you with signing up to my MLA to also help make life a little bit easier for you. So to start off with, um, Integrity Systems Company, for those of you that um, haven't heard of us or don't know about what we do, ISC is a subsidiary of Meat and Livestock Australia, which is a service provider to the industry. So MLA and um, Integrity Systems Company provide those industry services. Now the organisations there in the top row are focused on policy and strategy, and they're often referred to as the peak industry councils, and they advocate on behalf of producers to a range of decision makers, and they include at the government level or at that service provider level as well. Now, all those organisations on that chart there do certainly have separate roles, but they all work together to support the future sustainability and profitability of the sector. So a little bit about Meat and Livestock Australia. So MLA is responsible for research, development, adoption and marketing activities on behalf of the red meat and livestock sector in Australia. We collaborate with the Australian government and the wider red meat industry to do that. And uh, we do that by investing in a range of initiatives uh, that contribute to producer profitability sustainability and global competitiveness. And the way that we do that is um, through investing those levies. So every time sheep, cattle and goats are sold, there is a transaction levy paid. That levy is then matched with Australian government dollars up to a capped point and invested into a range of R&D and marketing activities on behalf of livestock producers. So Integrity Systems Company, we manage and deliver Australia's red meat integrity system. And it's this system that underpins consumer confidence in on-farm production of Australian red meat. And it covers both on-farm assurance through the Livestock Production Assurance Program or LPA and identification and traceability through the National Livestock Identification System or the NLIS, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Now ISC works collaboratively with government and industry primarily through the Safe Meat Framework to deliver these world leading traceability and assurance programs. And these are the foundations of the Australian Red Meat Integrity System. So the Red Meat Integrity System, which is made up of that identification and traceability and on-farm assurance components, ensures that Australian red meat is safe to eat and fully traceable. It provides on-farm assurance, animal identification and traceability from paddock to plate and it underpins the Australian livestock selling system and it gives confidence to buyers, retailers and consumers all around the world. So just to put all of that into context as to why it's really important that we do have this um, red meat integrity system that underpins our market. And that's because the Australian red meat industry is now a $28 billion industry. It employs 400,000 people across 80,000 businesses and delivers product to 100 global markets all around the world. So we're a pretty serious, a large and an important industry to the Australian economy. And there are thousands of people who depend on our industry for their livelihood and also their food security and protein requirements. And that's both here in Australia and all around the world. Now the confidence that consumers have in our product is based on traceability along the supply chain, which provides accountability right back to the farm where the animal was raised and production to an assessed standard. So as a first world country, we often take it for granted that our food is produced safely and ethically here, but that's not the case in every country. 
And when you are selling food, and that's what we do as livestock producers, we are food producers. When we sell a lot of that food to international markets, and certainly that is the case in Australia, then transparent, rigorous production systems that require audited record keeping on farm are essential. And our international buyers require that these systems are in place. Now we've got some examples on the slide there from overseas where there's been issues overseas, such as mad cow disease, um, foot and mouth disease, African swine fever. It's these sort of risks to our farms and consumers that we absolutely want to avoid. And these just highlight why that integrity system that is made up of identification and traceability and that on-farm assurance component is so important because it protects our industry prosperity, our market access and competitive advantage. And that's linked to our reputation for providing safe, high quality food. And it supports premium prices and positive overseas perceptions of our product and ensures that Australia's reputation as a clean green supplier of food is maintained. Now, while there are multiple producers and many, many properties across Australia, the integrity system really is about delivering one measure of quality through one integrity system. And regardless of where you are in the value chain or the role that you play, everybody has got a role uh, to play to ensure that we stand by what we sell. Now, I realise that we've probably got varying levels of experience on the webinar. So just as a quick refresher, um, we'll provide a bit more detail about those two programs which work together to underpin our industry's food safety and traceability on farm. Now, the first one of those is LPA or Livestock Production Assurance. It's all about on-farm assurance covering uh, on-farm management of food safety, animal welfare and biosecurity risks. And this is your tick of assurance for your product from uh, producer through to consumer. And it demonstrates the professionalism of our industry and underpins market access for Australian red meat. Now NLIS on the other hand is all about identification and traceability. It tracks the location of every animal throughout its life. It's mandatory uh, for producers and endorsed by major producer, feedlot, agent, sale yard and processor bodies. It's underpinned by state and territory legislation and enhances Australia's ability to, to track livestock during disease and food safety incidents such as chemical residues. Now there are three other elements to the red meat integrity system in Australia that um, underpin and bring that whole program together and they are listed there on the screen. There's the property identification code, there's the LPA national vendor declarations and then there's that thorough uh, record keeping. Now PICs are the central component to both programs um, and they are a property identification code and they're required for registration with the LPA and the NLIS. Now PICs are managed independently by State and Territory Departments of Agriculture and their incorporation into LPA and NLIS is the only way that traceability and food safety can be managed at a truly national level. And for an industry that exports a very high proportion of its product overseas, as I've said, uh, the assurance of a strong and effective national system is really important. So our international customers don't necessarily care what state um, their product comes from. They want to know that it comes from Team Australia and that we've got a national program in place that means that we've got um, a really high quality product. So LPA, that's the on-farm assurance component uh, to the red meat integrity system. What does that actually mean for you on farm? Well, LPA accredited producers commit to carry out um, farm practices that support the integrity of the entire system. And this is verified when producers then sign their national vendor declarations for those livestock movements. And there's seven core elements um, to LPA and they're listed there on the screen and we'll come back to those um, in a bit bit more detail shortly. So NLIS or the National Livestock Identification System, what does that actually mean for you on farm? Well there's three main elements to the NLIS and that enables the lifetime traceability of um, Australian livestock and the first is that all livestock are identified by a visual or an electronic ear tag or device. Uh, the second component is that all physical locations are identified by the, a means of that property identification code. And then the third element of the NLIS is that all livestock location data and movements are recorded in a central database and that is the NLIS database. 
So when animals are moved or transferred between picks or between those property identification codes, that's when the LPA and the NLIS come together in the form of the LPA uh, National Vendor Declaration. So the NVD brings together all on-farm assurance, identification and traceability details. And this is the basis for ensuring a safe and traceable food product. Now the NVD captures food safety information on every animal, every time it moves from property to property, to processes and to sale yards. And the NVDs provide evidence of that livestock history and on-farm practices when transferring livestock through the value chain. Now we did say as part of um, advertising for today's uh, webinar that we would go through a couple of changes which have been rolled out over the course of 2020 for the NVDs and hopefully you will, will have seen this in a variety of communication over the last couple of months. Um, but there's three main changes and that they, um, they are listed there on the screen. There's changes to the NVD versions for all species. Uh, a new ENVD system was released in at the end of March this year and you can find that um, by visiting the ISC website. And then we've also, uh, will be decommissioning by the end of this year, the EDEC platform. So just a quick word on those NVD changes, which took place from the 1st of July. Um, a safe meat review last year recommended that a number of changes be made to the NVD and that's resulted in these updated versions. Now these changes provide an easier, more efficient and cost effective system for producers and the others in the supply chain to interact with the integrity system. And these changes also align with the industry goal of the integrity system of the future being easy to use and valued by industry and trusted uh, by, uh, by consumers. Now the NVD changes in 2020 include changes to the NVD for all species and I'll speak about that in a second. But there's also been the release of the new ENVD system and you can find out more about that um, on the ISC website. Uh, listed there on the screen and we'll provide you with a couple of um, handy links following the webinar as well. And the EDEC system is also being replaced by the ENVD. So anybody that's got EDEC tokens um, still left, these can be used up until uh, the end of this year. So as I said, um, there's new versions of LPA NVDs for all species now available. They became um, uh, available on the 1st of July and they're identified by version number 0720 and you can see that they're highlighted there um, in those images and um, it's consistent across all species. Now current versions of the NVDs will continue to be accepted up until the 31st of December this year. However, from the 1st of January next year, only updated versions of all species uh, will be um, accepted. Now just a note there um, that under MLA's Accelerated Adoption Initiative, there's currently no cost for NVD books until the 1st of July, uh, 2021. So what's changed? There's been, I guess, three main changes to the NVD, which has just been um, uh, released. The first is uh, the number of EID devices in a consignment um, as part of the sheep NVD. The second is the inclusion of the destination pick. Um, now the destination pick is actually a mandatory requirement um, in WA and Tasmania. However, we are encouraging you all to um, include this information on your NVDs. It certainly makes doing your NLIS transfers um, a lot easier when, it, when you get to that point. Uh, a couple of integrity insights there. How do you actually find out the destination pick for when you're completing your NVD? You can uh, ask your agent, you can ask the buyer uh, before you're loading at the yards, for example. You can search for a pick in the NLIS database, or if you are using the ENVD, you can um, use the search function there and it will certainly um, point you in the right direction of the correct pick. And just a note on when you are completing your NVDs, um, the difference between a consignee and the destination, just be careful with these. The consignee um, quite often can be different. So for example, if you're selling um, animals through a sale yard, for example, the consignee would be your livestock agent and the destination would be the sale yard. So you would need to make sure you included the pick of the sale yard. So the biggest tip 
I guess, to helping you with your compliance and um, therefore meeting your requirements as part of the integrity step um, system is to fill in every LPA NVD correctly. And so the aim is to make sure that every NVD is filled out so that it is clear, correct and complete. Now this means that when you're answering the questions on the NVD, that you ensure that you check your records. Uh, when it comes to the questions about treatments the animals might have received, again, check your records. Now there's a range of questions asking whether animals have been treated with HGPs, for example, scabby mouth vaccine for sheep, or whether they have consumed restricted animal materials or whether livestock might be within a withholding period or an export slaughter interval. Now, for all these questions on the NVD, the message is, if in doubt, play it safe and tick yes. Another important tip is to tick yes or no to a question, not both. So the information on NVDs is crucial for food safety and market access. And when you sign it, it's a declaration that you've met all those seven uh, LPA requirements, which we'll touch on here shortly, but that also the NVD is complete and correct. Now your LPA NVDs are a legal document and are part of your LPA record keeping and so therefore can be audited, hence why we're here today. So on that note, let's um, take a deeper look into the LPA. And before we do that, I might just touch on the ENVD. So there's just a couple of notes there on the slide. Um, if you would like to, and I certainly encourage you to, you can start, you can move across to the ENVD system. It's um, more accurate than the paper version. It reduces time and uh, duplication spent completing a variety of livestock assurance documents and, de and health declarations, because you can nominate the forms that you would like um, completed and it will populate those all for you at the same time. It reduces the cost of storing and retrieving historical consignments for auditing, reporting and administrative purposes. And this was um, very handy, certainly after the, the bushfires when a number of producers lost all their records. And of course, you don't need to wait um, for new NVD books to arrive if you are um, using the ENVD. So I guess the question here is, can you stand by what you sell? Are you doing what is required as part of Livestock Production Assurance and NLIS? Um, are you prepared to be audited? Uh, if that actually does occur. So we do conduct about two to 3,000 random audits per year. Now, LPA is um, integral to ensuring that producers can stand by what they sell. And while there are multiple producers and many properties in Australia, the, as I said before, that system is really about delivering one measure of quality through one integrity system. And that's why livestock production assurance is the on-farm assurance component that does that. It provides evidence of safe farming practices, evidence of livestock management practices. It ensures that we meet the stringent requirements of our domestic and export markets. And so underpins our market access and it also protects consumers. And it's your pledge that the meat from your farm, so the food that you produce as a livestock producer has been produced safely and ethically. So as I said before, um, I guess the red meat integrity system is a, a system of measures and programs that underpin our, our market access. And you can see on that diagram there on the slide, and you'll be able to see this when we circulate the, the recording afterwards, that LPA and NLIS um, are not in isolation. Um, the programs are all linked um, together. But what we'll talk about now is we'll go through in particular about LPA so that you can be prepared for an LPA audit um, if you need. So as a producer, what do you need to do to make sure that you're meeting your LPA requirements? So there is about, at the moment, about 190,000 participants in the LPA pr pr program. And being part of it means that producers um, need to do several things. So you need to keep your online LPA account details up to date. You need to maintain your LPA accreditation. So this includes doing the online learning and the assessment to understand LPA's requirements for livestock and property management and renewing your accreditation every three years. Accreditation with LPA gives you more options for marketing your livestock and means that you can access LPA NVDs for all movements between picks. You also need to manage your livestock and property in line with the seven LPA on farm requirements. You need to manage, uh, sorry, maintain thorough records as evidence of livestock history and on farm practices and be prepared to undergo an audit if requested. 
So LPA is an audited accreditation. So as a livestock producer, you agree to complete an audit when asked, and this provides that accountability from paddock to plate. So we'll now just take a quick look at each of those seven requirements um, in a bit of detail. So your, accre your account and your accreditation. So you need to access and update your account details by visiting the LPA website. So lpa.nlis.com.au. If you're a new or a renewing producer, keep your knowledge up to date by using the LPA learning modules. And these have got a range of tools and information that you need and will help you complete your accreditation as well, of lot, as, well as lots of great tips and tools to ensure that it's easy to incorporate um, LPA into your specific livestock operation. And LPA accredited producers need to renew their accreditation by completing an assessment every three years. And you'll be notified by ISC um, when your accreditation is due three months before its expiry. And when it's time for you to renew, all you need to do is review those learning modules, complete the assessment, which takes about 15 minutes, agree to the conditions of LPA and then pay the fee um, every three years. However, at the moment, as part of that um, MLA accelerated adoption initiative, there's also no fee uh, for LPA accreditation until the 30th of June next year. So how do you meet the seven requirements of LPA? As um, mentioned earlier, these seven separate but complementary elements make up the um, LPA program. And whilst participation in LPA is voluntary, producers who do choose to become LPA accredited commit to carrying out practices to support the integrity of the entire Australian red meat system. So have access to LPA NVDs as well, um, and a number of um, other marketing opportunities for their livestock. Now, all of the requirements for LPA are outlined in a lot of detail on the ISC website, and there's also a link to the LPA guidebook, as well as the LPA uh, learning, which takes you through each requirement before you complete that assessment. So just on each of the seven um, different elements of the LPA. So the first element there is around the property risk assessment. So as a producer, what's your responsibility in regards to this element? And that's about minimising the risk of livestock being exposed to sites that are unacceptably contaminated with persistent chemicals or physical contaminants. So how do you meet that requirement? You can complete a risk assessment and a map. You update the risk assessment when changes occur on farm. And again, another ex a good example of that is um, after the bushfires went through, if you're making changes to your farm infrastructure or fencing, for example, and then you need to document and file that risk assessment and, and map. Here's an example of a, a map with the risks highlighted on it. Um, that you might like to use. And there's also an example of a template to complete the risk assessment documentation. Now these templates are all available on uh, the ISC website, or of course you can create your own. So the second um, element of LPA is around uh, safe and responsible animal treatments. So as a producer, your responsibility is to ensure that animal treatments are administered in a safe and responsible uh, manner and that that minimises the risk of chemical residues and physical hazards to the animals. How do you meet those requirements? Well, you need to document and file all animal treatment details and this includes things like treatment date, uh, the animal or the mob identification, chemical or the drug use, the dose rate, all that type of thing. Um, you should also complete a chemical user course and this is um, particularly relevant in certain states where it's actually mandatory or for different types of chemicals. Note when equipment used for livestock treatment is cleaned. Uh, record the authorization and directions for any off-label use um, of chemicals. Note animals that are exposed to physical contaminants, such as broken needles. Um, and mark animals treated with HGPs uh, with a triangular earmark. The third element of LPA is stock foods, fodder crops, grain and pasture treatments. So again, the producer responsibility here is to minimise exposure of livestock to foods containing unacceptable chemical contamination and guarantee livestock are not fed animal products. How do you go about meeting those requirements? And these are the types of things that might come up or you might be asked to supply as part of an audit. Again, is to keep records of all agricultural chemical treatments. So this is things that you might be treating pastures and crops, fodder, that sort of thing with. Have management systems to identify livestock that may have become contaminated or consumed these materials. Again, so that you can fill out your NBD accurately. 
map or list from treated or contaminated sites on your property, and then source and file all commodity vendor declarations that accompany introduced stock feed. So if you are purchasing stock feed um, in, it's always good to ask the supplier to provide you with a commodity vendor declaration. These are available on the Integrity Systems Company website. So then you've got the food safety history of that um, product that you've then fed to your animals when the time comes to fill out an NVD. Item four is preparation um, for dispatch of livestock. So as the producer, what's your responsibility? You, is to ensure that livestock are fit for transport and that minimise the risk of stress and contamination of livestock during assembly and transport. How do you go about meeting these requirements? You need to record the transport details, including vehicle registration and key times. And of course you would do this as part of your NVD. Only select and transport animals that are fit to travel or fit to load. And we've got a great resource called the Fit to Load Guide um, that will help you with that. Inspect vehicles prior to transport. Observe any pre-consignment curfews or sale yard curfews. And choose transport operators that are in recognised QA programs, if that's applicable to you, depending if you're part of a, um, a QA program yourself um, or if QA uh, accredited transporters are available in your area. The fifth element of um, the Livestock Production Assurance Program is around livestock transactions and movements. So the producer responsibility here is to ensure that traceability requirements with respect to treatments or exposure to food safety hazards have been fulfilled for all livestock movements. So how do you meet these requirements? You need to record all purchases and sales. And of course you would do this as part of the NLIS database as well. You might also have a second set of records. You need to keep copies of all LPA national vendor declarations. It's very easy if you're using um, ENVD or an, another um, third party supplier such as AgriWeb for your NVDs. You need to record the vendor's name, address and pick. Again, really useful if you're actually completing your NVD um, accurately because this information would be at hand. Record the livestock details and descriptions on the NVD. Keep records of all animals purchased and while within a withholding period or export slaughter interval. So if that's um, animals that you're purchasing in. And then you need to document animals that may have been exposed to any physical contaminants that you're then letting onto your property. And you'll start to see now where some of these other elements overlap into um, the remaining elements of LPA, which are biosecurity and um, animal welfare. So biosecurity was an element that was added to LPA in 2017. Uh, the producer responsibility here is to develop and maintain a documented farm biosecurity plan and to implement effective biosecurity practices on your farm. Now, how do you go about meeting these requirements? Um, you need to keep a documented farm biosecurity plan and you can do that by using a range of templates. There are many templates available for a biosecurity plan. Um, and I would just like to make the very strong note that biosec managing biosecurity risks is um, not a one size fits all. It's very much dependent on your risk appetite and how you want to manage that risk. And there's no right or wrong answers for managing biosecurity risks. So for example, where I am here, we're a super fine merino producing uh, property. So probably one of my biggest issues is around lice. I'm also in a very uh, big small landholder area and have seven neighbours. So my biggest biosecurity issue, as I said, is probably lice and um, other weeds. So fencing in particular, boundary fencing is my biggest biosecurity management strategy. So. Um, but that might be very different to somebody that's in a much more extensive area. But it's just about having those biosecurity things, which you've been doing anyway, um, and it's a lot of it is common sense, but it's about documenting that and having the evidence to um, support that if you are audited. Um, some other tips there around sourcing a livestock health declaration or equivalent for any um, livestock that you introduce. You should always ins um, inspect introduced livestock for ill health or disease. Uh, keep introduced stock in isolation for a period of time. Minimise the risk of any straying stock. Um, having systems in place to notify unusual diseases, illnesses or mortalities. And also control movements of people, vehicles and equipment entering your property where reasonable and practical. And again, it's always good to be um, to apply common sense as well here. And I mean, another example, and I know people like sharing examples and case studies, but um, we have big issues with people coming on property to um, inspect uh, power lines and the like. 
um, well, yes, or even meter readers and things like that. Well, if they are coming onto the property and they are just staying on formed roads, well, then the biosecurity risk would be minimal. However, if they are going from property to property at certain times of the year and not cleaning down vehicles, there is a potential for transporting weeds between properties. So again, it's understanding the risk and then putting um, uh, practices and management things in place so that you can manage that risk. Here's an example of an on-farm biosecurity plan template that you can use. This is the LPA one. It's available on the ISC website. There are many available uh, that you can use. And the seventh requirement um, of the LPA program is animal welfare. Now your responsibility as a producer is to ensure that the handling of livestock is consistent with the Australian animal welfare standards and guidelines. And to do that, how do you meet that requirement if you are audited um, or if you're not audited but you just um, need to be doing the right thing anyway is to make sure that you have a copy of the standards and guidelines accessible as a reference. Uh, the person responsible for the property has received training in the standards and guidelines and that's done through the LPA learning process um, online because you'll actually receive a certificate once you've completed that and that staff involved in any livestock husbandry on the property are familiar with the contents of the standards and guidelines and have been trained in a manner that's consistent with those guidelines so that can be uh, by the um, person responsible for the um, for the property and the animals. Now I'm not asking you to go and print off the standards and guidelines. It's a fairly weighty document. You could use it as a, um, a doorstop. It's simply about downloading it, bookmarking it as a favourite um, on your uh, laptop if you would like and saving it and making sure that all your um, team members uh, have access to it and know where to go to find it. So that's a bit of a snapshot, a very quick snapshot of the um, seven elements of LPA. So then what actually happens uh, if you do get the call up for an audit? Um, I guess the first tip there is um, don't panic, uh, but basically all LPA accredited producers, irrespective of the number of livestock on the pick, may be audited. Um, people are selected at random from the database of all LPA accredited producers, including producers with just a few livestock. Um, qualified auditors from on Osmeet conduct those, um, those audits and if you are selected for an audit, a producer receives an LPA audit advice pack and that contains a whole heap of um, really helpful information to help you prepare for the process. Then you're contacted by the auditor um, to organise a mutually convenient time for the auditor to visit and conduct the audit and also conscious that um, during COVID restrictions that also might be problematic and we are looking at doing um, audits online but you can talk um, about that with an auditor at the time. Uh, the audit notification pack does include a checklist um, and it's always good to review your on-farm practices against this checklist um, and that'll identify any areas that need attention uh, before the audit actually occurs. And the tip is that the more preparation that's done before the audit, then the smoother the process will be. Uh, on the day of the audit, the auditor will check how your records are maintained and how the management of food safety, biosecurity and animal welfare risks is being carried out on your property. They may accompany the producer on um, an inspection of the property facilities relating to those areas and the LPA rules and standards, so a chemical store for example. Uh, parts of the farm that have been identified as contaminated within, with persistent chemicals, so those risk sites on that property assessment that you did um, as part of part one may also be uh, visited to ensure that the management systems are being implemented at those particular locations. If an issue is identified at an audit, it's called a non-conformance. Now these are um, identified through either minor, major or critical categories of non-conformance. A minor non-conformance would be recorded as an observation and for example might be an improvement to record keeping. A major non-conformance would be recorded by the auditor as a corrective action request um, and so the producer might need to take action to make a change on farm within a certain time period. While a critical non-conformance is a serious issue that puts food safety at risk such as animals being fed restricted animal material or a residue detection above an MRL or stock, food, uh, stock found chewing or licking an old battery, for example, at a um, property inspection. An auditor would record this as a critical incident report and your LPA accreditation may be suspended until the producer can demonstrate that the issue has actually been addressed. 
So the key tips there, don't panic. Um, audits are about identifying areas for practical on-farm improvement. Uh, your LPA records will be reviewed by an auditor, so it's important to make sure that they're accurate and up to date. And this includes your NLIS transfers on the NLIS database, as well as all your um, national vendor declarations, but they will give you tips um, in order to improve your record keeping. And there are about 3,000 um, audits conducted uh, each year. So just to finish up, I do have a couple of slides um, from an integrity insight point of view. How do you align your record keeping um, with those seven LPA uh, requirements to make your life as easy as possible, but then also make um, auditing straightforward as well? You can download um, some free templates uh, from the ISC website. If you search for LPA record keeping templates, you'll find um, a range of products there and handy checklists for you, uh, as well as some more information that will help you keep accurate records and records that will be sufficient for an audit purpose. And you can do that. Um, you can also order a um, free hard copy of those if you like as well. And producers, of course, can use um, their own uh, systems as well. Now, record keeping, I've talked about that a lot. Uh, the audit and you being compliant with meeting your requirements is all about record keeping. Um, we do, however, have a number of practical tips to make sure that you can gather that baseline information. There's no perfect, um, no perfect formula. There are a couple of ideas which might help you. Um, for example, you can ask your supplier to add the ag chem or the vet chemical product batch number and expiry date to the invoice uh, when you're purchasing your products so that you actually have that for your livestock treatment records. You're not then back down to the shed, turning around a label and the label's faded because it's been in the sun or whatever and you don't actually have that information. I'd always encourage people to use your phone, um, take photos of information on the box and file it with your livestock records. So everybody's got a smartphone now, take a photo with your phone, um, they're date stamped, you can add it to your notes or you can um, also use it with your um, decision support tools such as AgriWeb. A good tip down here that I use if I'm drenching sheep, for example, I'll put the sheep in the yards, I'll make sure they're facing me. Sometimes I need the dog to help me with that. Um, have the drench drum in front of the photo. Uh, the sheep are looking at me so I know which colour tag they are. And then I can take a photo and I've got the, um, the chemical uh, record as well with the batch number and expiry date there and that's your livestock treatment details done. When purchasing fodder, make sure you download a copy of that commodity vendor deck and ask for the supplier to fill it in for you as well. Now, of course, um, the AgriWeb app is one of the tools that are available to assist in managing the LPA requirements on your farm. Now, here's a practical example of how Simon and Christina King um, use AgriWeb at Muniong, which is a property 30 kilometres northwest of Cooma on the Snowy Mountains Highway in the Monero. And I can um, only imagine what the weather's like down there today. Uh, they run a fine to medium wool merino stud Avonside, as well as Angus cattle breeding operation. And they're using AgriWeb to record chemicals and veterinary product inventory, uh, animal health treatments, uh, ESI and withholding period uh, warnings, and then all livestock movements via the paddock apps. And you can see just an example of um, their uh, map and animal records there on the screen. Now, uh, Simon and Christina actually went through an LPA audit um, process in late 2019, and it was the first time that they'd done uh, an LPA audit and they'd been using AgriWeb for about 18 months at that time. But prior to using AgriWeb, their records were strong in livestock movements and animal health treatments, but lacking in a complete in inventory, both of animal health and ag chem products, including batch numbers and expiry dates. Um, during the audit, they were able to use the app to demonstrate a complete animal health history and movement history uh, within their farm and had a complete list of products and how they were applied uh, to their livestock. And this means that if there was a problem, they could trace back stock and um, where they had been on the farm and in particular when a mob is treated, it immediately shows that ESI and withholding period um, on the map. Uh, the next step for Simon and Christina is for them to use the faster, easier NVD capability. So all their movement records will be totally digital 
and they're looking forward to being able to have the, the ENVD self-populated within the information that's entered um, into AgriWeb. So, and also with all their records, uh, their records then being cloud-based, it means that it's all um, neat and tidy in one spot. And there's less chance of the old handwritten notebook um, accidentally going in the washing machine, but it certainly is a much more expensive um, consequence if your phone does end up in the washing machine. Um, however, you can see up there on the screen, um, for example, um, down there sort of midway to the left, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you can see there's 128 sheep in a particular paddock. They may have been treated with something and those animals are still within a withholding period. So that's a little double W and uh, the E there. So when it comes to filling out your NVD for those animals, if they were to be moved to another pick, for example, you would receive um, a warning and you would know that they're within that um, withholding period when it comes to filling out that information. So just to finish up, um, Integrity Systems Company, we've got a whole heap of information um, available to you. Uh, we launched a new website in November last year, integritysystems.com.au. Uh, it's a one-stop shop for all things uh, integrity, so I'd encourage you to reach out and check it out. Uh, we have a monthly e-newsletter, which hopefully you all receive. One went out earlier this week. Um, and it's called Integrity Matters and it's our sort of hub for all news and information. If you don't receive it, please reach out or you can subscribe uh, on the Integrity Systems Company website. We're on all the usual social and uh, digital channels, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. We've got a whole heap of um, tools and resources available, including some very handy um, animations now um, to help with completing NVDs, how to um, move over to the ENVD. There's the LPA learning, uh, which I talked about. Lots of frequently asked questions on the website, fact sheets, and um, all those record keeping templates as well. Finally, um, I would encourage you to sign up to My MLA, and um, within My MLA, you receive a customised dashboard depending on your location and your farming system. Um, but the real game changer for my MLA is that you can link all your integrity accounts and therefore um, access those programs such as NLIS, LPA, MSA and Livestock Data Link by using only one username and password, which is fantastic because I don't know about anybody else, but um, I struggle to remember all our username and passwords just for uh, life in general. Uh, at the moment with the number of accounts that we do online. And just finally, before I finish up, just a reminder that um, uh, the NVD in particular is a, a declaration. Uh, we at ISC or your advisors um, can't do it for you, but we absolutely are here to help you. And we have a range of um, resources that we can um, uh, supply you with so that you can um, therefore meet your requirements as part of the integrity system and therefore stand by what you sell. But um, team on the line, um, thank you. That's my presentation done. I'm now happy to hand back to you guys and then take some questions. Cheers, Kathleen. Thank you very, very much. Um, absolutely detailed uh, insight there. And, and to be honest, um, the most in-depth look I've ever um, had of the systems and, and all things in there. So I, I dare say that um, everyone listening in really appreciates that insight because it's, it's certainly valuable to, to um, get all those requirements and have that detailed list of, of what's needed and, and what to think about. Um, so just, just switching um, a nice transition over to a bit of a look at uh, at how AgriWeb can complement um, what's required uh, for uh, any, any sort of auditing really. Um, LPA is, is one program um, that is there, but as we know, there are lots of others depending on, on the market that, you, uh, that you're in. So um, what I'm gonna do is just share my screen and we're gonna have a look at the web app um, that we view on, on the internet browser to have a look at some of the elements within AgriWeb that um, complement all the things that, uh, that Kathleen has just shared. So um, what we're looking at first is a treatment uh, report. So um, we will have a look at how you get this information into AgriWeb, but um, first off, we're looking at a treatment report here which collates all the data um, as you're doing the stock treatments on the ground um, and as you've got your, you know, your inventory items in there and things. So um, 
some of these numbers being a demo farm, some of these numbers might be a little off, but uh, the, the key here is that you have the, the full um, list of information, the, the mobs that were treated um, and the, the products that were used withholding periods you can jump in and get um, batch numbers and expiry dates added to this report as well um, and and you've also got this customizable um, date range as well now one of the one of the key things as well is that you can group and and um, customize this report in various different ways so if you need to look up specific um, age classes or mobs, um, it might be a management tag, it might be um, a, a certain weight bracket or something that you're looking at. Um, and as well, the, the treatment uh, that was used or the method, you can pull that up nice and neatly there. You can print and export this as well. Uh, so that's, that's an example of the treatment records. This is for the livestock. Um, if we go into the cropping side as well, into the cropping reports, you've also got paddock treatment records there as well, which are, is, uh, is useful for the, the fertilizing and the spraying. Um, we've got another look over here uh, with the biosecurity plans. So you can access this from the um, next to the dashboard. So we've got some templates here for the biosecurity plans that you can add in. Um, and they, you can fill those out and have them saved and, and logged in here. Um, and that also means that anyone on farm, anyone who's using AgriWeb, uh, staff members or family members can also access this as well um, and be in the know of, of what the practices are. As, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, we uh, are able to facilitate the use of the ENVD as well. Um, so anyone who is interested, I'd encourage to jump on and have a look. Um, you, what this integrate button does is links your LPA account uh, with AgriWeb here, and then you can jump in here and, uh, and submit your vendor declarations. Um, equipped with the, the health decks um, and the stock information in there as well, it's, it's quite powerful. Um, so if you, if you are wanting to explore that, feel free. Uh, and then there are some other areas as well, um, it, back into the reports, the purchase and sale um, reports um, for mobs, all that data is collated as well. So you've got that reference there. Um, and the interesting thing around the risk assessments is um, that you could also utilize your farm map to pinpoint some of these, um, it, depending on the, on the kind of template that you'd like to use you could list all that information, um, potential risks and things utilizing the mapping functions on here and have that available. Uh, now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen of the mobile app and we'll just have a look at how you can actually enter some of this data in, in terms of the treatment records and potentially some of the sales and purchases. So um, just let me get the iPad up. Uh, so uh, anyone at home with this as well, feel free to, to have a look. Um, the first thing that I want to call out is under menu in the bottom right hand corner, you've actually got the inventory section here. So you can, this is where you can log your animal and paddock treatments. Uh, so you can come in here and we can see the ones that we've already got in here and we can add these in. We have actually launched as well um, with some of our, uh, through our partner program, um, our retail partners. Um, they've started to launch a digital inventory system where when you purchase them in store, they will actually um, upload the information for you so you don't need to input it. Um, again, if you did want some information on that, feel free to, to reach out and let us know. Um, so once you have your inventory sorted um, and you can add the inventory on the go, when we go into a mob, we see the, um, the options to, to treat down here. So we can treat all the, all the mobs that might be in that paddock. Um, we can add more into this. And then we go next to this page where we can select the treatments that we're gonna use. Now, a lot of people um, might not update their inventory um, ahead of time, but you can add a, a new item straight from here, nice and quickly, and just fill in the two pieces of information that's required and come back to the other bits and pieces at a later date. So if you are on the go, if you are in the yards, you can quickly input um, the, the pieces there with asterisks and then away you go, you can complete this treatment record. 
all of that information equipped with the expiry dates, uh, the batch numbers, uh, will go through to the, the reports that I just showed on the, on the computer there. Uh, so that's just a quick look at that. Now we have actually launched um, a, a series of training courses um, under the banner of AgriWeb Academy, where you can dive into an in-depth um, training, structured training, so that you can be accredited in the use of AgriWeb um, and be up to date with, uh, with how to use that across the farm for scenarios like this. Um, we've we've um, taken through hundreds of farmers over the last few months um, through uh, those courses. So uh, it'd be great if, uh, if anyone does want um, an in-depth uh, training um, of how to do the inventory. We've got two courses, the inventory and compliance, as well as the, um, the fundamentals of AgriWeb. So if anyone is interested in um, jumping on board some of that training, uh, get in touch with the farm success team and we can organize that um, prices start around a hundred dollars a seat uh, and we can um, organize you know a whole team if we need to if you want staff family that sort of thing um, and it's really great for all those farm owners um, and managers uh, to to have everyone through that training as well because that takes you know the pressure off you it means that everyone on farm is up to speed with what, what's required uh, and how to use uh, all, of, all of the functions there. So um, what we might do now is um, jump into some of the q and I know we are um, just pushing on the hour, so please do um, stay on board to have these, answers, an these questions answered, sorry, um, and we will try and get through them. So um, Kathleen, there will be a few um, for you to, to jump in and answer as well. Um, but we might go to the ones that are um, at the top there. Um, there's a question from Heather. Do landholders need to pay for audits, um, same as the ESA, or is, is the, the LPA auditing free? My understanding, and I'm just going to double check, but my understanding is that there's no fee for LPA audits. And I will confirm that while I'm still on the line. So <laughs> I'll come back. Yep. Very good, very good. Um, and then we had another one there around the, the image of the biosecurity sign that you had in one of those slides. Mm -hmm. um, do we know if it's necessary to, ha to have a phone number in there? Well, I guess the first thing to note is that the biosecurity sign is not actually compulsory. I mean, you might like to check with your um, state department, but we're not asking, like, as part of the biosecurity requirements for LPA, you don't have to have a farm sign. So that's the first thing to note. If you do have a sign, I guess it's about providing that information so that people can contact you because you, are, you might be concerned about people coming on and off the property and managing that biosecurity risk. Um, so it certainly makes good sense to have the phone number, but I understand the question did have some, I mean, are you wanting to get, um, if you're next to a, a national park where you can go recreational shooting and things like that, that might actually be a little bit of a problem. But um, yeah, I think you'd probably have to address that on a case by case basis. Great, thanks Kathleen. Um, there's uh, one here from Karen and uh, will we be notified when the renewal is due? Now, um, Joanna yep. uh, flips me a message there earlier and said that yes, around two months out of the renewal, you'll get notified, um, but you actually have a period of six months prior to that where you can uh, go in and, and update the, the details there for the renewal. Yep, so the accreditation renewal process, you, yeah, you'll you receive a letter, three. it's actually three months before the process um, and you'll get a couple of reminders um, but and it will we'll communicate with you in a number of ways. You might receive a hard copy letter or if we have your email address and it won't just be one communication, you'll get a, um, a reminder each month until, until it's finished and you might also get an SMS. Brilliant. Um, Susan here has a question, the SNG training, do you have a list? Um, I'm sure I've done it, however, no certificate. Um, so it might be a good idea, Susan, if you um, get in contact with, uh, with a member of the team there and, and try and organise a certificate there. Yeah, so that's got to do with the animal welfare standards. So. Um, there isn't a list per se, it's just referring to doing the actual LPA learning, which is on our website or the LPA service centre. And once you've completed that, it should generate a certificate. But yes, you're right. If you haven't received one and you have done it, then absolutely reach out and we can um, check that and make sure you have one. 
Great. Uh, Monique has one there. Um, as a dairy farmer, we're regularly audited by a milk processor. Does the LPA audit requirements overlap at any point with the milk processing requirements? Um, the LPA auditing or the LPA requirements probably wouldn't at a practical level overlap with your milk processing um, testing of milk for residues and things like that. I mean, apart from within a couple of the LPA requirement areas and but in terms of LPA audits of dairy farms, uh, we don't do random audits um, of dairy because of, of course dairy has a number of other auditing uh, programs in place. However, we would do a targeted audit of a dairy farm um, from an LPA on farm assurance if, if a need arise. Okay, um, Heather has another question in there around how long um, does an on-farm audit take roughly? Uh, and second part to that, are there any issues um, with auditors visiting during COVID-19, um, which I think you touched on earlier? So I guess how long does an on-farm audit take would depend on how good the tea and scones are, I would suggest. <laughs> um, I suspect, I mean, I've heard that audits can take a couple of hours um, up to half a day, but again, it depends on how chatty the auditor is and how chatty the farmer is um, and the information. And I mean, the size of the property and um, the nature of the record keeping and, and that type of thing. But yeah, it wouldn't be a, an all day exercise. I mean, yes, there probably have been issues um, with audits um, during COVID. And as I mentioned, and again, this would be um, dependent in a particular area, obviously with restrictions now different in the different states, um, but we have got the capability to do um, some of that record keeping and things online through the LPA Service Centre. That's great. And I suppose um, if, if you are using some sort of software to do your record keeping, um, that will uh, save a lot of time. And uh, that means there's more time for the tea and scones. More time for scones, very important. <laughs> um, the, the next one there is, um, is there any need to keep hard copies of ENVDs? I know that if, if um, anyone submits them through AgriWeb, they go directly to um, the LPA database. Uh, so Kathleen, do, is there any need or is it all um, stored in the, in the database? There? So if you're using the ENVD and you're using it, um, I guess, right through to completion of the actual ENVD. And with that, I'm referring to probably the transporter stage. So if you've got it and the transporter's actually signed it using their, their finger um, on the phone, for example, and you can save that through, then you wouldn't need to have a hard copy. And that would also depend on whether or not your um, transporter is happy to um, use a PDF version on their phone, for example, as the way bill. So then you wouldn't necessarily need to keep a hard copy or you wouldn't need to print a copy off for them, sorry. Um, so if it's fully complete, then you can absolutely just have it as an electronic copy. However, if you needed to um, print it off at any point to have it signed, then you would probably need to keep a hard copy of that. Great. Uh, there's one there from Joe. Um, does AgriWeb work on tablets? And if so, on both Apple and Android? Absolutely, it works on any mobile device, Apple or Android. Um, so you can download the app. Um, and then there is also the web app component on an internet browser, which can also be accessed on, on a tablet as well, if, if you'd like. Um, uh, from Belinda there, um, we've been using EMBDs for two years, uh, roughly, but not, um, but we haven't had a chance um, to be able to submit to the point of sale electronically. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an insight on um, some sort of uh, updates that might be coming for that, Kathleen? Yep, absolutely. So um, thanks for your question and feedback, Belinda. Um, the development of the new ENVD system, which was launched um, at the end of March this year, has really been focused on consignment creators, so that's producers and feedlots, um, until this point. However, in the next six to 12 months, ISC is focusing on consignment receivers. So that includes sale yards, feedlots, abattoirs and the like. So um, this in combination with the offline capability, because we also are very aware of the fact that um, connectivity is a real problem as well, um, that we expect um, all consignments will be able to kept to be um, completed and submitted completely digital from start to finish over the next, um, you know, next year. So the message there would be keep an eye on our website for updates and we'll of course be promoting those big changes. Um, through Integrity Matters. Great, thank you. Um, there's a, another question there on how, roughly how far back are the records reviewed in an audit? Um, 
I suppose if you've never been yes. audited before, that might vary. So there's actually some regulatory requirements there. So from an NVD point of view, you're required to keep your NV copies of NVDs from an LPA and an integrity systems company point of view for three years. However, that does differ between states. So a number of states require you to keep those records for seven years. Um, so uh, it depends on the state. So as I said, NVDs are certainly something that can be auditable. So check with your state um, the length of time that you need to keep those for, but for the purposes of all the other LPA records, it would be three years. Okay. Um, from Lucinda there, um, understanding we're needing to provide the PIC number for sale yards on NVDs, um, she's had trouble finding some of the sale yard PICs um, in the NLIS database search before, um, and, and some meat processing plant PICs um, are hard to find as well. Mm -hmm. um, is there an easy way to find these? I know in, um, in when you're searching for the pics in Agareb in the ENVD, um, we do have that. I'm not actually sure what uh, database that might be linked to. So it could be the same as the NLIS, um, but you could also try that. Kathleen, do you have uh, an idea there? Uh, yep, so there's a couple of ways that you can get the, um, the destination pick. So the first thing would be to actually ask the, um, ask your agent. So if you're selling them to um, a sale yard, for example, then I would just ask um, your agent. You can always ask the sale yard. Um, and again, I mean, if you're doing this on a more than like on a reasonably regular basis, we'll just pop it in your phone. So just have a, a list in your notes on the phone um, where you keep your regular picks, for example. However, yes, what you said, David, around the, the ENVD capability, either the ISC version or if you are using an app such as AgriWeb, the pick search function in there is really quite sophisticated and very easy to use. And again, if you are doing them uh, regularly, those consignments, it will pick up those destination picks for you. But um, the NLIS database, which is about to undergo a fairly significant revamp, um, is a, a bit um, difficult to, to do the search function. But um, yeah, I'd just reach out to your agent or the sale yard, keep a record of it for any future NVDs you're filling out um, or use the ENVD. Oh, and David, just going back to that um, that fee question, I've just confirmed yeah. that um, only LPA QA and um, the National Feedlot Accreditation Scheme uh, audits have a fee. So all other LPA on-farm audits are free. Great, great. Um, does AgriWeb system automatically complete their um, ENVD with additional information such as animal treatments? Um, it, it certainly does. Um, it'll input the information into the health deck um, if the mobs that are selected have that information there. Um, but if you do want some a bit more in-depth look at that, feel free to reach out to the farm success team and we can look at that with you um, and give you a hand in setting that up um, if you need. Um, we are um, pushing for time at the moment, so we'll go through a couple more questions um, and then we will start to, to wrap things up. Um, there's one here from, um, from Meg, is it possible to attach, uh, biosecurity plans in different platforms? Um, I assume that might be looking at attach that, um, in AgriWeb. Um, I will check on that for you and, uh, we'll be able to reach out to you regarding that, Meg. Um, having a look at, at some of the others here. Um, Karen, in regards to a chemical user course, where can these be found? Um, I believe we might be able to grab um, a, a couple of examples there and add them to the resources um, that we'll include in some of the emails going out after this. Um, so just to let everyone know, this uh, recording will, will go out to you um, and we'll provide some resources there. So hopefully we can get some of those uh, different courses in. Um, and uh, Beck there. Who, who can we talk to about um, database records? We lost so many cattle in the fires and records are totally lost. Where do I go from here, please? Um, that is quite a good question. Kathleen, do you know if there's um, access to the database there that they can go to? Absolutely. So probably in a situation like that, and I'm really sorry to, to hear about that. And we've certainly um, had a couple of examples 
um, in the last couple of months and I would encourage you to just reach out to Integrity Systems Company. We can do that through the help desk. I'll make sure that Hannah's got some um, contact details and we can absolutely try and get you as much information as we can and it might involve doing a complete reconciliation of the NLIS database, for example. So identifying what animals and therefore what tags remain on farm, removing anything um, that has obviously perished in the fires, we can get them off the database and just start from scratch there and see what um, records remain in terms of um, copies of NVDs and things like that. But um, that's probably a one-on-one -on -one conversation and um, absolutely you can um, reach out and we can help you through that. Great, thanks Kathleen. Now, um, it, is, it is 10 past one. Um, I know it might be raining, but I'm sure there's still lots to be done for, for everyone. And I really do appreciate everyone tuning in um, to the session today. Thank you for Kathleen. Thank you for Joanna for assisting um, with the questions there. Uh, please do follow up. Um, if you do have any questions, um, Integrity Systems would love to, to hear your questions. And of course, the Farm Success Team at AgriWeb, please reach out if you would, uh, would like some training there with the AgriWeb Academy or have some specific questions um, that you need a hand with. But uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rain that's coming through. Uh, and uh, please have a good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in. See you later.